Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dual Axis Podcast, where I explore the world of data analysis and visualization. I'm your host, Andy Kriebel. Today, I'm excited to have Valentina DiFilippo with me. And I think I got that right, Valentina. You'll have to correct me. But right, she is right, an right, award-winning right. designer, creative director, and co-author of the really cool book, The Infographic History of the World, which we're going to talk about today. Her work has made a big impact on how we see and understand data, earning her international recognition. She runs training classes and master classes for The Guardian. She has um, content at the Victoria and Albert Museum and much, much more, and also has a collection at the uh, Welt Museum in Vienna. And I know I said that right with a V because I study German. So a lot of people <laughs> probably call it the Welt Museum. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, uh, so Valentina, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, I guess before we get into it, I want to talk about your TED Talk, but before we get to there, I want to understand a bit about how you got into this field in the first place. Yeah, so good, uh, good question. It's been a bit of a journey, to be honest. I didn't really set out to become a data designer or an information designer. I actually come from engineering. Um, I studied industrial design, and then I did a master, a postgraduate degree in visual communication. And while I was studying visual communication, I started to get down the rabbit hole of data and information and complexity. So somehow data found me. Um, but then I landed my first job in advertising and I worked in advertising for a number of years as a digital designer, a director. And then actually through my thesis that I developed during my master, an editor at HarperCollins got in touch a few mm. years ago saying, hey, we would like to have a chat with you because we saw that you are actually pretty good at um, distilling complex information through your thesis. Yeah. And we would like to create a book about history, but through uh, data visualization and infographic storytelling. And I was like, me, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> completely like uh, you find me? Impo yeah. imposter syndrome of like, yeah. I never yeah. created a book. I'm not really specializing in information design. Um, sure like sounds super interesting let's have a chat so i got into um this amazing journey of creating a book with james ball that was my co-author he was a data journalist back then for the guardian they used to have the data blog um this was uh, yeah. 2012 it was one yeah. of the the first i suppose like data data driven journalism um team um and yeah, we created a hundred infographics in quite a short amount of time. We had about six months. We stretched the deadline uh, a few times, uh, but I think uh, all in all, um, less than a year really to yeah. conceive, create, and go to publish, which was like really, really intense in terms of uh, in terms of experience, lots of work. And it was just basically me and James. James was doing mostly the data research, and I was creating uh, all the visuals. Uh, and together we kind of like come up with the ideas of like, uh, what do we create? Uh, what type of uh, content do we want to cover? What type of questions do we want to answer with our book? Of course, history is such a broad kind of like <laughs> field, right? Like how do you condense history in a book? So we just picked basically a hundred topics that we were interested about. And uh, yeah, from prehistory to the modern world, we created a hundred infographics. And I suppose that became like a really kind of uh, physical business cards of like, hey, I can do this stuff. I can do data visualization and infographics and then open up um, this world of, yeah, data-driven storytelling. Um, so from printed infographics to other books to digital experience, dashboards, apps, now everything I do uh, has got this common denominator of data um, and storytelling to it. And of course, my, my specialty is the design, the visual yeah. part. How many did you throw away? So you ended up with 100 in the book. <laughs> Good question. Um, yeah, and if you thought about for... making a book of the stuff you got rid of, the stuff you didn't <laughs> No, it was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty bad for your standards. Even, you know what, actually, after the book came out, there were a few, a few infographics that I really could not see, and I was really not happy. But I suppose it helped to have a deadline, because even the content that you're not 100% happy with of course, yeah. um, made a cut. But, you know, like creating a book of 100 infographics, they're all like super good quality and you're super satisfied with execution is really hard. Um, 
but yes, yeah, definitely there was a there was a good maybe 30, 40 that went into the bean. And with any iteration, with all the hundred infographics that went into the bean, there were so many iterations just to get to the point where I was like, okay, this is this is okay. Okay. -ish. Yeah. yeah. I, I used to teach a data visualization class. I still I still do occasionally and and I remember I don't remember the visualization, but it was a there's an album on Flickr. I don't know if you remember Flickr. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the pre-Google photo. I guess Google yeah, yeah, yeah. that. But there was a designer who had come up with um there were about 130 different iterations of a visualization. And they mm -hmm. all have, you know, kind of subtle tweaks. And you could see, you could see him go from this one thing back to a, you know, really simplifying it along the way and then coming more more complicated again and going back to almost like the original. And I was, and when I teach about that, I'm like, probably could have done 130 more, but it's all, you know, how do you decide when is it good enough? Right. And I guess that's where deadlines, deadlines help as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You, Otherwise it's kind of like never ending. Yeah. And how does your data, how does your engineering background, I must said data engineering, but how does your engineering fit into this, do you think? I think it probably, um, I think my background in kind of like engineering or maybe technical disciplines kind of like taught me problem solving quite well, okay. you know, like empathizing with an audience, knowing that there is a problem that we need to solve. Um, but also it doesn't make me scared of data. So oftentimes I suppose like if you're just trained in uh, visual communication or graphic or branding, um, the technical part can be quite scary. And I suppose like just uh, comparing myself and my background being trained in engineering, I always found myself quite driven to briefs that presented some sort of complexity, mm -hmm. not the briefs that were very exciting because they were like, um, you know, branding or visual communication or exciting, um, yeah, visual puzzles, but more like, oh, there is actually quite a lot to communicate here. How do you yeah. break it down? Um, so, yeah, I suppose like I was always uh, a bit of a bipolar. Uh, I always had this kind of <laughs> science and art kind of like fighting, mm -hmm. but at the same time, data visualization was a sweet spot where I could marry the two. Yeah. What, um, how often do you get to create something for fun? Like just something that you're not, you know, you, I'm sure most of your work is probably paid for work, um, obviously. Um, but how often do you get to do something that's just for you? Just something, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, so I suppose like uh, um, self-initiated projects were always a constant in my development, in my journey. And I think like really helped me to cement my experience and also like, became a bit known in the field, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think even just the, the opportunity with HarperCollins came from a project that I self-initiated was about gender stereotypes in illustrated books for kids. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was able to exhibit my work because I started this investigation of uh, Space Oddity by David Bowie. Um, um, also like another project was self-initiated about Shining by Kubrick. So yeah. I suppose like I always kind of like just try to find subjects that they were interested in and then push the visual representation or the data communication um, around, yeah, subject that they were kind of like mm -hmm. calling them in thinking, if I'm interested, probably other people will be interested in this subject. Yeah. Um, and really creating a portfolio that was mostly based on self-initiated projects allowed me to create, to then attract clients that I was more um, interested to work with than other type of briefs. Um, and nowadays, I suppose, I'm kind of like privileged or lucky enough that I get actually to do some fun projects that are commissioned projects. Uh, like, for example, my latest collaboration um, with a publisher, with Britannica, we created 250 mm -hmm. infographics for books, for, um, for kids to create this uh, encyclopedia there. I don't know if you can see it. Maybe I should. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, nowadays I suppose it's a bit easier because I do attract opportunities that are actually quite fun and creative. But okay. at the beginning yeah. of my journey, it was super important for me to to have this uh, creative outlet. Yeah. And also like just to keep it fresh and to keep it uh, to keep my mind engaged and inspired. I think it was really mm. really important. Yeah. One of the things that I stress to to people, especially that are new in data visualization, is that is the importance of having a portfolio mm -hmm. um, that I, I assume almost all of your work now is driven by 
your portfolio, right? Does anybody ever ask you, you know, what is your degree in, right? Everybody probably goes straight to your portfolio and says, hey, this work you do is really awesome. I'd like to work with you. Yes, absolutely. And it's actually even more word of mouth, I suppose, than portfolio. Mm -hmm. Like people just recommending me um, or seeing, yeah, seeing the work that I've been doing for other clients, for other people and kind of reach out to me saying, hey, we've got this. We saw that project. Uh, could you do something for us? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the work really speaks uh, much more than any sort of certificate or mm. um, qualification. Yeah. What do you think about keeping? Uh, so a, another thing that I recommend is when you build things to make sure everything that you create is public. So you can see a progress in your work, right? Especially if somebody's kind of new in their career, you want to you want to be able to see that they've kind of learned along along the path. What do you think about that about keeping your not so good work, but then, you know, seeing it uh, get better as you go on? How do you how important do you think that is? I think it's important. I think it's important to kind of like showcase the uh, way of thinking. In fact, if I just uh, can share um, uh, the, the the story of like actually how I got to work with HarperCollins, um, of course, they didn't reach out just to me, right? They reached out to a few designers saying, hey, we want to do this book. But I think I actually won the, um, the contract or... Um, uh, or the project because I showed the behind the scene of how I went from data into the final output and I was the only designer mm. actually showing the process and they oh, kind okay. of they kind of understood that I wasn't afraid of a spreadsheet because I was able to quick prototype different type of charts I was able to pull in um, a new layer into the data mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really really important to show the behind the scene and the kind of like work in progress um, and not just the kind of like uh, pixel perfect outcome because it shows the thinking. And there's something that's also like when I'm interviewing and I'm and I'm looking for designers myself uh, um, or for clients that I'm working with, uh, I'm really, really keen to not just see like this kind of like tribal or Instagram portfolio, but really I'm looking for the thinking, right? Like the, the problem solving mm -hmm. ability. I suppose though, it's important to kind of like um, filter out the projects that maybe you're not so proud of, because also when you're sending out your portfolio for interviews, you need to be mindful of how much time does an art director, a client, or somebody that is interested in yeah. this work gonna have. So it's important that the 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 quality work is surfaced to the top, right? At the top, um, yeah. yeah, of course, yeah. So yeah. the the person that is interested in your work can actually be wowed. Uh, in a few minutes um, and it doesn't take maybe 20 30 minutes to actually get to the <laughs> to the cherries because otherwise yeah you're not gonna have a chance uh, mm -hmm. so I suppose like in that sense less is more um, less projects good quality projects but showing the behind the scene the thinking I think that would be my right. uh, my advice yeah yeah and when you start working with stakeholders, so I, I work mostly on the business side of data visualization, so yeah. focusing on dashboards. And but a lot of the processes are similar. Um, what is your what is your process for understanding requirements from a client? First of all, having a clear brief. So if the client doesn't have a good brief, um, probably like arranging a discovery meeting to just come up at the end of this discovery meeting with a clear brief, and the brief is. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the data? What is data saying? Do you have a clear idea of um, the story that you want to communicate? For example, uh, a client not um, long ago got in touch saying, we've got all of this traffic data of London. And I was like, yeah, but what is the story? What is the point right. you want to make, right? There's because, a lot of traffic in London, of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what do we want the project to point out? What do we want to highlight? Do we know that? Mm -hmm. Or do we need to do some sort of analysis, discoveries? Because that right. also is going to take a lot of time away from the design process of just discovering mm -hmm. the data and trying to figure out the, the angle. So it's important to know whether the client already, already has a story and a clear insight that they want to communicate or you need to figure that out um and also like uh, whether they might have already like some sort of like preconceived idea or uh, for example um a client might come to you and say we want to create a map is the map the right type of visualization or right. do you need to push that um 
uh, obviously budget, the channel. So all of these kind of like um, considerations that needs mm -hmm. to happen right at the beginning of the project. And from that, yeah. uh, also maybe the impact that the project will have might define the scope mm -hmm. of the, the scope of the project and the costs that you might want to put and attach to it. Um, and then from that, you kind of like go into a discovery uh, of exploration, um, the visual art direction, creating mood boards, um, and then you start prototyping, and then you get feedback, um, possibly not just from the client, but also from potential users. You refine the project, and then you publish it, and mm. you celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Are you familiar don't with the Dear don't David? Forget the celebration. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes, George. Yeah, yeah, with Georgia Lupi and, and Steph um, Prosevec. I, I always butcher her name, but because um, uh, a guy that I know through the Tableau community, he and I actually did that for a year as well. We started about six months after them and did the same the same themes. We just kind of oh, followed. amazing! And that was that was incredibly difficult because I am terrible at drawing, and you know, um, collecting the data was actually pretty much the easiest part, but then coming up with ideas when you're not using a tool, a tool. to do it like I'm used to was incredibly difficult, but it, it, it really helped. But I didn't know if you were familiar with that project. I mean, their, their work is just incredibly Phenomenal. beautiful. Yeah. 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 Big fun. Big fun of both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned maps and, you know, is that the right type of visualization? And it, it, that makes me think about your Ted talk. And for me, that's a that's like a bucket list item for me. First off, how cool was it to do a TED Talk? Yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, um, <laughs> I was uh, terrified to actually speak <laughs> Italian and to and to step on the red dot. Uh, but yeah. yeah, it was great. It was a great experience, of course. I saw it was during COVID because everybody was sitting a seat apart with the masks yes, on. Yes, uh, exactly. And at the, end, you, at the end, you did the string <laughs> exercise. Yeah, that was really neat. Yeah. Um, so, but what I, what I really love, what, you know, you did such a good job of like capturing my attention at the very start of the talk. And you start with your story about how you had people around the world draw a map and what does a map look like to them and how they're always, wherever they live, that's this kind of center of the map. Tell, tell everybody about that, about that story. It's like super fascinating. People have to watch your TED talk. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bit of an obsession of mine, but I started in 2009 uh, when I was traveling for the first time in Japan and I came across the world map, not from a Eurocentric point of view, right? So Japan and Asia was in the center um, and therefore East and West were mm -hmm. kind of like um, flipped around. And that totally confused me. And I was like, hang on a minute. So do you it, yeah. actually see the world this way? And so I just decided to collect during my trip a few maps and draw maps while I was uh, visiting different parts of Japan. I met new people, old friends. And um, yeah, I, I collected these hand-drawn maps and I loved it because of course they all share this uh, egocentric approach of representing the world where they yeah. put themselves in the center. So Japan was clearly in the center. And then somehow they had this abstract recollection of the world. They kind of capture also their personal stories, right? Like how much they've traveled, um, mm. whether, um, whether they have a good ability to actually translate these uh, these notions into the paper mm -hmm. or not um, in their experience. And so I decided to keep doing it. Every time I was visiting a new country, I collected these hand-drawn maps and also allowed me to, you know, connect with people in a different way, which yeah. I thought it was quite neat and cool and uh, a fun things to do. And then in 2013, I started to actually um, uh, run a masterclass for the guardian and i thought wouldn't it be cool if i could actually um include this practice at the beginning of the workshop it's kind of like an icebreaker for people to familiarize themselves with sketching and also like telling data stories because the map itself is a data driven story right it tells us where you're from it tells us also like your ability to um to simplify kind of like uh, complex notions in this world and also tell us about geography and uh, where you've been and so forth. And I started to actually make people also map data onto the world map, not just um, draw the, the borders. Um, 
and yeah, that's that's something that I'm really fond of. I've been doing that for 10 years or more as oh, wow. the data visualization icebreaker. Um, and I've got a collection of hand-drawn maps that is about 700. It's, uh, it's fascinating. That's really um, cool, yeah. 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 One day I would like to do something about it. <laughs> as you traveled the world then, did you, did you see that consistently as a theme where, you know, so when you were in Japan, Japan was at the center of the map. Like if you were in South America, were they putting South America in the middle of the map? So in a lot of countries in South America, you still have a Western approach because... Um, oh, because of where they're located, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, and because of, you know, the, the European influence on the culture. Yeah. Um, but um, you will still see some sort of like a deformation of the map based on where you're from. So the country where you're from usually takes so much more space than the rest of the world. Yeah, I noticed that Russia was as big as Japan in some of the... <laughs> yeah, it becomes the dominant kind of uh, um, territory, right? Which makes sense yeah. because it's the territory that you're most familiar with. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I've been to Pakistan and again, like uh, Pakistan and all the areas around there are really well defined. Um, same with African countries, like it's, uh, it's fascinating. And of course, the more you travel, the more your understanding of the world expands. Um, but it was also fascinating. One of the most beautiful and really perfect kind of drawing from um, kind of like a fidelity point of view was a man in Japan that actually never traveled the world, but somehow his education was so, um, yeah, somehow, I don't know, like he probably studied geography quite well. Right. So his recollection of the world was just incredible. Um, oh, wow. He had all of these islands in uh, in the Pacific, Indonesia, the Philippines, all really like sketched mm. out properly. And it was amazing. Yeah. And, and one of the themes throughout your talk is how and, and actually throughout your work as well is is bringing kind of the people and the emotion into the visualizations and and this and the, the pieces that you create. Um, so, uh, you know, everything's most of the stuff you do is, is kind of people centric. It's about the stories that that people um, that people are trying to tell you or you're trying to bring out in those people. How do you bring out that aspect into kind of a flat, essentially a flat piece of paper, right? You know, it's a drawing that you're creating in the end. What, how do you go about communicating some of that? Because I, I look at some of your visualizations and, and you know, you study it for a while and it starts to make more sense. Um, but how do you even come up with with the with those ideas and, and how to take that information and tell th those kind of personal stories and bring that emotion into it, you know, starting with a simple spreadsheet? Yeah, I think like for me, it's really like just trying to communicate um, not just to the rational brain, but to the emotional um, level. So to connect people um, and the brain and their hearts to what you're trying to say, right? So often I feel like in data visualization, we find that our job is complete because we've rendered the data, right? Whether it's a bar chart or uh, whatever tool we're using. And it's like, okay, that's it. But do people actually understand what you're saying with the bar chart? I think that's super important, right? Like who is behind the bar chart? Are we talking about banana sales? Are we talking about about mm. uh, the human sacrifice of uh, war. So for me, it's really important to use design to give voice to the data in a way that it can kind of like make you see who is behind those bars, but also make you feel something. Mm. Um, so I'm really trying to kind of like use semiotics and visual language to kind of like connect, um, to connect our audience so that we don't just use our visual cortex and the pattern recognition, but we actually get to the heart and somehow we can uh, recall empathy or compassion, whatever that is, so that we can mm -hmm. actually uh, get into our next action based on yeah. this map or this visual that we've just seen. Um, and I suppose just linking back to the, the uh, drawing the world map, what is uh, important for me of that is uh, that there are so many different stories that we can map on this world map and there are so many different ways that we can actually interpret the stories because whenever we actually come in to read a data visualization or a chart or an infographic we overlay our own understanding of the world right so whenever i'm looking at a map i'm overlaying my own understanding of the world my own vision of what the world map should look like um, so the more we can kind of like use visual language and words and annotation to spell out our stories, we are going to be able to orchestrate how other people can interpret this map mm -hmm. because we all 
going to have different interpretation based on our own agenda, based on our own bias, based on our own understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's uh, just to close back on to yeah, <laughs> how do we do that and why do the world map um, matters? Yeah. Yeah. Do you consider yourself an artist? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'm a designer. <laughs> What's the difference? I suppose um, a designer is more like into the problem solving and usually you do your work to kind of respond to a brief. An artist is probably more um, a creating work that fulfills their soul. Um, and then it puts it's a commission piece of art. Um, I suppose like you can also do that, uh, but this, the starting point usually for artists is the quest, right? It's an artistic yeah. um, uh, quest that comes from a very, very personal um, point where I usually work with audiences and with a brief yeah. uh, to connect an audience to uh, a yeah, mm -hmm. specific yeah. starting point. I'm trying to get you to, to, to tell, call yourself an artist because your work looks like art, even though oh, it's about- Oh, thank you. And also maybe maybe it seems like such a loaded word to be calling myself yeah. an artist. I don't you know. think of painting, um, right? And, and that kind of thing. We think of artists yeah. or sculpting and, and things. But that's what you're doing. You're just sculpting data. Right? Maybe. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you shouldn't sell yourself short there. And another piece that you talked about was the one that you created for the Museum of London about mm -hmm. um, COVID in, in London. Yep. And um, is that still is that still in the museum? So that's actually in um, in the permanent collection, but it's not being exhibited right now. Also, the museum oh, okay. is relocating to Cleckenwell. Um, oh, okay. I was going to go. So, I'm going by there this weekend, so I was going to go by and, and see if it was there. So no, it's not exhibited. But yeah, it's in the permanent collection at the moment. It's in the archive. Uh, the idea oh, for the piece is actually um, being part of a larger collection. Um, oh, I don't remember the name, but it's about yeah recollecting COVID or um, mm. capturing yeah. COVID. And the, the idea is really for um, the future audience, let's say in 10, 15 years, um, the Museum of London will probably recall these times uh, and they want to narrate what happened with art, with, with um, objects, uh, with mm. pieces of communication, as well as uh, um, uh, commission work like the um, London under the microscope, the project that I did. Um, and so it's not been exhibited right now. The idea is uh, to create some sort of like time capsules for the future, okay. uh, yeah. for future audiences to kind yeah. of like uh, get back into the space and time. Um, there was madness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been almost four years, I think four years ago in a couple of weeks was, was the first lockdown. I mean, it's crazy, crazy. isn't it? I, yeah. I was talking to my kids the other day about how it was like the nicest weather we've ever had in the UK. Uh, you know, you could hear birds on the streets in London and it was you just- You can not go out. <laughs> yeah, well, you could, you know, you could walk with one other person or, you know, something like that. But it was, uh, I mean, just, I just remember how spectacular the weather was. And I wonder if, if it's just that we had time to appreciate it more than anything else, because you're not focused in, you're no longer focused on the hustle and bustle of, of everyday life, right? Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, uh, so if you were to, um, let's say that you were asked to do a KPI dashboard, something mm -hmm. that you probably would, I don't know, to me, I would think you would despise it, you know, like it would be beneath you. I, but, I do a lot of KPI uh, dashboards. <laughs> Um, yeah, my work does that, not look like a very creative or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I promote a lot of like that type of work in in the stuff that I do, um, and there's a few things in particular that I focus on. But I'm, I'm curious to know, like, what is if you think about a business con context of a visualization and people trying to make decisions, what are the most important aspects of that to you? For me, it's all about hierarchy. Whenever we are presenting information, it's all about deciding what is the focus, what is the key piece of information, what is a supporting piece of information. And to decide what hierarchy information is going to take, you need to understand how the audience is going to use it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What type of information do they need? Um, how long do they have to actually look at this dashboard? This is something that they come to every day and do they uh, operate in a certain manner or do they come here once a month and they just like uh, quickly scan it? Um, so understanding user context is super important and their mm -hmm. user needs. 
And then it's all about laying, uh, laying out all the information that we need, not more, um, because we don't want to overwhelm the brain. Um, and if there are more information, then maybe uh, some use cases uh, might need, like how do you actually lay that uh, maybe with, through interaction, through a second view, through a click, yeah. uh, opens up these, uh, this complexity. But yeah, it's all about hierarchies so that we clarify the information and we don't over, uh, overload the brain. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all about also storytelling. Even in a dashboard, I think there is an element of storytelling. Um, of course, in a dashboard, there is a lot of like non-linear interaction, but there is usually a linear entry point of like, these are the KPIs. This is like the key uh, overview uh, yeah. of the stats that you're interested in. These are the this is the body of like the story, the key pieces of information that you want to act on. And then where are you going next? And it might be detail or um, I don't know, uh, opening up. Um, Going to another team tour or something, yeah, yeah. Going to another yeah. dashboard, yeah, yeah. Um, if if people are looking for inspiration from, you know, let's say uh, they're they're building business dashboards, where would you recommend they look? Hmm. I don't know, but usually, actually, I don't find inspiration in data visualization itself. But it's all about in the subject matters or sometimes in popular culture. But I know that often in the world of data visualization, you just want to kind of like uh, stay close to the kind of like abstract way of representing information and not necessar mm -hmm. necessarily bringing to life the story through infographics or, or visuals. So what I'm usually looking at whenever I'm creating something that is very much abstract and chart based is the latest in UI and UX. So I want to create the smoothest possible interaction, the smoothest possible UI. So I'm looking around for products or um, um, yeah, interaction and user experiences that are popular. Like even just like looking at products like Uber or Airbnb and taking a look at how they open different views or how um, right. the buttons interact, how the overlay appears. They can actually bring quite a lot of inspiration into, uh, into a digital dashboard that might not be already there, already kind of like built in, uh, in the template. Right. Also right. usually I, whenever- I so it, it's almost like, think about the things that you use every day how do you use them and why do they work well for you? And then mm. how can you bring And then apply it to the world of data visualization, right. yeah. Oh, that's a really interesting way. I've never thought about thinking about it that way. That's really interesting, yeah. And that's, that's when you can actually innovate and create something that is, um, is unique or is different. Also yeah. maybe spaces that do data visualization well, well, but not specifically in a business dashboard or business intelligence tools. Like, you know, they use a suspect like um, the usual suspects like the New York Times or the Washington Post, just taking a look at their data journalism. You usually find really good um, data-driven articles and, uh, yeah. and and way of charting data that, you know, like can kind of like uh, inspire you. Mm -hmm. Is there, Have you ever had a project or is there something that, that you are really excited about that you've never gotten to work on? Um, so I'm really excited about actually moving away from visualization and just designing with data um, through different senses. So I've just started to tap into this idea of sonification. Um, but I think I'm actually quite excited to um, yeah, explore a different way of communicating data that could be more physical, mm -hmm. more tactile, um, because visualization is quite a narrow way of looking at what we can do when we're communicating data. So I think definitely like I would like to do more of that, um, exploring different senses when we're communicating data. Also, now that I tapped into the world of infographic books for kids, I think there is a whole uh, world there that I would oh, like yeah. to explore yeah. of uh, communicating for kids. I think there isn't that much. And I'm highly frustrated uh, with the way the, the educational system works, that yeah. you kind of abandon visual literacy to focus on numeracy and words, when actually visual yeah. literacy is like the down of how we communicate and how we perceive the world. And I think there is... Uh, there is something there that we can uh, we can definitely work on to help kids yeah. to not to abandon visual communication and visual literacy, but to kind of like extend it into the world of numeracy mm -hmm. and to build more um, database for for kids. Yeah, 
I've got one one last question for you. First off, or actually two questions. First one is, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Um, email usually is the best way. Um, I might be slow, but I usually get through my emails. And social media, I'm slow, but I sometimes do get through <laughs> all of yeah. them. Just so so if I just put, if I just give a link to your website, everybody can find everything on there. Okay, I'll yeah, do that. And yeah. her website is unbelievably cool. You have to go to the portfolio page because there's this really really neat like scrolling thing that shows all of your projects. It's almost like a flipboard, but you don't see anything flipping. It's like it's hard to even describe what it does. It's like super super cool. I'm like, oh, I'm oh so glad God, that you're like saying that because experience. it's been. A it's been on my list of things that I need to redo and rebuild my portfolio. Why? I haven't touched this since 2018. Oh, it's incredible. Um, it's one it feels of the, like really the out of date. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, it, it, it gives you kind of project by project, but maybe there's not a portfolio as a whole kind of, kind of picture to it, yeah. but yeah. But um, so if somebody who's just getting started in data visualization, so let's focus on the data visualization side and uh, not the design side. Um, what advice would you offer? Uh, create a portfolio that you're excited about. Um, there could be like any sort of subject, you know, like uh, data is everywhere. It's all about just like um, collecting it and communicating in a meaningful way. And if you're excited about something, usually actually comes out in your work that you're excited and other people will be excited about. Um, also, you can go down the route of specializing one specific software. I've seen that mm -hmm. being uh, quite helpful for some people. For example, the Tableau community where you're part of, and is yeah. uh, great, it's super vibrant. There are lots of people doing lots of cool stuff. And uh, it seems very inclusive as well. Like I've heard people yeah. like being yeah. part of these chats and social media groups where you can get quite a lot of support for free. Um, but I also feel like um, uh, there is room to just be quite experimental and you don't need to be attached too much to one tool in specific. So it, it all depends what works for you. Um, but I've been tool agnostic for the last 16 years and it's worked out for me. Um, yeah. So don't, I suppose like, uh, this just to say, don't get scared if one solution of one software doesn't work for you, you know, like because yeah. you're not mastering Tableau doesn't mean the data visualization is not your thing. It's right, right. Speed of the tool is not the right tool for you, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So don't don't be put off by that. Um, and I suppose just put your work out there. Because I mean, you can keep your um, your work in a drawer or in your sketchbook. Nobody's gonna see it. It's not it's not gonna do any good to you or to anybody. But you put your work out there, uh, even if it's not perfect, even if it's half finished. You might get an editor hub calling, seeing it in a few years, and say, <laughs> "Hey, do you want to talk about this book?" Yeah. Uh, and it's exactly what happened to me. So yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. one of your visualizations you show starts as a scatter plot. And then mm -hmm. you gradually add stuff to it and tells the story. It's just, it's, it's fascinating. So I will put a link to your, uh, your portfolio, the Ted talk. And if you're listening to this, you absolutely must watch the Ted talk. It's, it's so, so good. And thank Valentina, you. thank you very much for making the time to talk to me today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. Thank okay. you.